I proclaim to you the Word of God this afternoon as it has been summarized in Lord's Day 52 of the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 52. We confess there the following. What is the sixth petition? And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That is, in ourselves, we are so weak that we cannot stand even for a moment. Moreover, our sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, do not cease to attack us. Will you, therefore, uphold and strengthen us by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that in this spiritual war we may not go down to defeat, but always firmly resist our enemies until we finally obtain the complete victory? How do you conclude your prayer? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, that is, all this we ask of you because as our king having power over all things, you are both willing and able to give us all that is good. And because not we, but your holy name should so receive all glory forever. What does the word amen mean? Amen means it is true and certain. For God has much more certainly heard my prayer than I feel in my heart that I desire this of him. So far our confession. Brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ and boys and girls who belong to him. Imagine that you were constantly being stalked by an enemy who wanted to take your life. Sadly, this happens in real life here sometimes too with people, the physical life. I think you would call the police You'd even, if you saw him every day, your enemy, you would call the police every day, 911, I need, I need help, I need protection. Police have the power and authority to do something about that anyway. Well, that's something like how it actually is with all of us as we confess in our catechism, how it is with all of us with respect to our spiritual life. We're in constant spiritual danger, and the danger is so great that we cannot save ourselves from it. And you know who is always stalking us, looking for our downfall, our spiritual death, right? Satan. Satan. We, we mentioned him this morning already, too. He wants to get hold of believers so that they come to think and do things against God's good will and direction. And he knows we're very vulnerable, still inclined to evil in ourselves. And he knows that our hearts are inclined to sin, and he likes to make use of that. Oh, he would like nothing more than to keep us from obtaining the complete victory which Christ has obtained for us and promised to us as God's people. And if we do not constantly seek help, the help of our Father in heaven, as Christ taught us, we will more and more fall for the, the devil and his host. And that's why the Lord Jesus taught us to pray the sixth petition. And I proclaim to you the last part of the Lord's Prayer with this theme. Christ teaches his weak people the sixth petition. Three things in connection with that, because we're still always in danger here. Secondly, because our Father in heaven is mighty. And thirdly, because our Father really wants to save us. So first of all, Christ teaches us the sixth petition because we're constantly in danger. Congregation, earlier on, we read the first part of the first chapter of the letter of James. It says there in verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Well, then you wonder about the sixth petition, right? If he doesn't tempt anyone, why would Jesus teach us to pray, lead us not into 
temptation. Well, to understand that, we have to take into account the context of what we read from James 1. James speaks a number of times about trials and then also about temptations in this section of chapter 1, which we read. And it's noteworthy that he uses the same word in the original language for both, for trial and temptation. Verse 2, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Later on, verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. And then verse 13, which we just mentioned, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. The same word is used in the original in this chapter of James for both trials and temptations. So what does James mean when he uses that word for trials and also for temptations? Well, the thing is, in the original language, that word can have two shades of meaning, and the exact meaning depends on the context in which it's used. It can mean tests. God brings tests or trials into our lives in order to refine us, to make us stronger in our faith and in the fruits of faith. Think of how it says at the beginning of Genesis 22, God tested Abraham when he told him to go and offer Isaac as burnt offering in the land of Moriah. That's the meaning James gives the word at the beginning of James 1. You can count it all joy when God gives you trials to deal with because he's actually working to help you grow in your faith and your trust in him, your patience, and we need that testing, don't we? For how would we otherwise grow in faith and steadfastness if God did not constantly test us, keep testing us, giving us trials to deal with in faith? However, that same word can also mean temptation in the sense that when God tests us, Satan is right there too, to tempt us, to tempt us to fall into sin instead of growing in our faith, to fall into sin. And then our own sinful nature, our own sinful desires entice us to act on that temptation. Think of how the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, about those who desire to be rich and fall into temptation and a snare because of that. He uses the same word there to mean temptation. And that's the meaning of the word later on in James 1, when James writes that no one who is tempted should say that he is being tempted by God. And the word used there is used there in the context of trying to make someone sin. God doesn't try to make us sin. He tests us. No, brothers and sisters, God, who is almighty, can allow and does allow difficult situations in your lives in which he wants to test you to grow your faith. But the devil wants to use the same situations to tempt us to sin. So God can lead us into situations which become opportunities for the Spirit to make us more steadfast and trusting in our faith. Or... They can become opportunities for the devil to bring us via our sinful nature to, to fall into sin. And here we can think of Job. Job was severely tested. God permitted Satan to bring trouble upon trouble to Job. And God was testing Job, but Satan was using the test to try to tempt him to give up on God. Think of how Job suffered, also because his three friends figured he must have done something terrible to deserve what he experienced. How Job struggled not to deny God in his righteousness and justice. 
And all Job's words throughout the book of Job are actually something like the sixth petition. Lord God, don't, don't allow this test to become a temptation for me. And his prayer was heard because Job did not deny God. And by the end of the book of Job, Job is stronger in his faith than he was at the beginning of the book of Job. So what is Jesus actually teaching you to ask for in this sixth petition? Well, he's not teaching you to ask your Father in heaven to keep you from various trials by means of which you can mature in your faith. No, count it as joy when God gives you trials of various kinds to grow your trust in him. What the Lord Jesus does teach in the last petition is that when your almighty Father tests you with those trials, his spirit may make you steadfast in your faith that he helps you resist the evil one who will do his best to use that testing to tempt you. Lead us not into temptation. Don't let the evil one make a temptation out of this so that I deny you by sinning. Because you know the devil will be right there when you're tested to cause you to question God's goodness or his justice is, is why is God doing this to me? And to appeal to your sinful desires in order to fall for the temptation. And you realize then that when we give in to temptation and sin, we can't blame God. We can't blame God. We can't excuse ourselves by saying to him, but you led me into this situation. I couldn't help it. And why can't we excuse ourselves with something like that? Well, in the first place, because our sinful natures and desires are not God's fault. We brought sin into our lives ourselves in the beginning, the fall. And in the second place, the test became a temptation for us, not because God made it so hard for us, but because we made it so hard for ourselves. Like James writes in verse 14 and 15, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death like a whole birthing process. In other words, we're so weak in ourselves that we can't stand for a moment as we confess in Lord's Day 52. We constantly need help. We constantly have to call 911 in prayer so that we grow stronger instead of letting ourselves fall. And if we didn't have that help, we would fall. We would and that's why Christ teaches us to pray. Lead us not into temptation constantly because we remain sinful by nature throughout our lives and Satan remains our adversary throughout our whole lives as long as we live here. But the wonderful thing is that we all have the promise of God that he will stand by us as his children in every circumstance. He has promised us the strength of the Holy Spirit to make us strong through the testing and the trying of our faith, and he has promised that because of Jesus Christ, who always withstood Satan, who gave himself for us on the cross as the perfect offering for our sins. And so we need to keep asking for the strength of the Spirit. We need to keep asking daily, every day, just as Jesus taught us to ask for our daily bread, every day again, lead us not into temptation, because every day again, God tests us. Otherwise, we'd never be able to continue in our faith and to grow in our faith. Every day, we need to make choices. Every day, we make choices. How should I react to that? with anger or with love and patience? What should I say in response to that criticism? 
Do I do this or do I do that for this in this case? Should I go there or should I avoid that place? Should I watch this or should I turn it off? And then God's word says, do this and you will live. But Satan says, no, do this instead and you will really live it up. And we need the same Spirit's help, that we need the Spirit's help day by day, and we ask to, have to ask for it daily, daily, brothers and sisters. And then I have to think here of the question, too, which catechism students often ask. Couldn't God have prevented the fall into sin and paradise in the first place? After all, he put that tree of the knowledge of good and evil there. Why did he confront man with having to make that choice in the first place? Eat from that tree or not? But we should never forget that God made man good and able to always choose good. And as his love, he even warned man not to eat of that tree and told him the consequences so that man could show his love to God, not only by doing good, but especially by turning to God for the strength not to do what God had forbidden him to do. And he would then grow in love through the testing of his love for God. Adam and Eve also had to ask, before the fall, had to ask for the strength of the Spirit of God to make the good choices in their lives. And so when the devil came and turned that test of that tree into a temptation for man, man could have and should have turned to God for the help and the strength they needed to resist the devil and not to eat from that tree, but they did not. They did not. And you see from that then too that it was our own fault and the down, our downfall that we did not seek the help of our Father in heaven right from the beginning. But the wonderful thing is, brothers and sisters, also after our fall into sin, God still promises to give people who are now also inclined to all sin, who only, not only have to fight the devil, but also their own sinful nature. He, he promises to give them the strength of his Holy Spirit to fight against the temptations which lead to sin and bring forth death, as it says in James 1. And that's because our Savior overcame every temptation and offered himself for us as the complete sacrifice for our sins and obtained for us the life-giving spirit. And that brings us to the second part of the sermon, namely, Christ teaches us in this sixth petition because that because our Father in heaven is mighty, we can trust in him. You might have noticed that when people pray the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer, some say, deliver us from evil, and others say, deliver us from the evil one. If you check out the English Standard Version, which you use here, you see it has deliver us from evil. But the evil one is more accurate since the Greek word used here is almost always refers to, has a, has a personification, the evil one, the devil, the great adversary of God and of his people. Congregation, the devil is very powerful. It's because of him that sin is such a great power in this world too. And we, people of God in the middle of this world, are so weak in ourselves too. In fact, we're helpless to the pull of Satan and sin. But you know, if we humbly and honestly acknowledge our helplessness and seek the help of our Father, then we are strong. Then we are powerful over against the devil and sin. The devil is so strong and I'm so weak, but my Father in Christ is almighty and so he's much, much more powerful than the devil in sin. And I ask him for his help. And to remind us of that, Jesus taught us to say right after the last petition, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And that, you see, with, that, with those words, you realize you don't have to feel helpless and low in the face of the devil because we're so weak in ourselves. 
I would feel, have to feel low and hopeless if I had to resist the devil and the sin around me and in my own heart on my own. I couldn't stand for a moment as, it, as we confess there. But not if I look for my life and help in my Father in heaven. He is almighty. He can keep you, and he alone can keep you standing in, in the fight against sin in your life. His spirit has the power to help me follow Jesus Christ in all the trials he sends me, even when my own sinful heart tempts me to sin. In fact, he has the power to make me stronger and stronger because of those trials he sends me. Every time you choose for Christ and against sin in your life, in the power of the Lord, you see the, the Holy Spirit at work in your life. Then you see and you feel that it's good to do God's will. It's good to live according to the Bible. Then the sin you struggle with has less and less attraction for you too. Brothers and sisters, boys and girls, our Father in Christ truly has a lot more power than the devil and the world and our own sinful nature and even death. He's not, he doesn't have to compete really with any of them. And the whole Bible shows that so clearly, right? Let me give you a few examples from the New Testament. You know how the Lord Jesus Christ was tempted by the devil. The devil wanted to prevent him from going to the cross as the perfect sacrifice for the sins of all his own all those whom the Father gave him. And so Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world if he would just bow the knee once before him and worship him, give him a word of worship. That was an attempt to tempt Jesus to win the kingdoms of this world without having to go to the cross. And that was something for Jesus' flesh. He had to face eternal hell and the devil gave him the opportunity to circumvent that. But Jesus said to the devil, Be gone, Satan, for it is writ written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. And after that, it says, Matthew 4, The devil left him, and the angels came and ministered to him. A another example of God's power shown in Christ is when he hung on the cross in Calvary and it became totally dark. He was enveloped by hell. That was his descent into hell. While he was still living, he descended into hell in those three hours of darkness. The devil focused all his power on Jesus at that time to try to get him to come down from the cross. He could, he could have tried to get all the legions of angels to come for him, tried to get him to give up doing God's will to the very end. And at the end of those three hours of darkness, though, Jesus still cried out to his father from the cross. And then shortly afterwards, he cried out in victory, it is finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit, Father. And he had received the power from his father to overcome the powers of hell. Mighty, mighty, brothers and sisters. One more example. The Lord Jesus died and was buried, and death seems so final for us, doesn't it? It certainly looked as if the devil and death had won the victory for good when Christ was buried. Even the disciples figured, well, that's done, that's over, that's defeat. And then on the third day, the Father raised Jesus from the dead. The devil could do what he wanted, but he could not keep Jesus in the grave, in the tomb. Peter said later on, too, death could no longer hold him. Jesus rose as the conqueror of the devil and death and sin. What might? You believe these events really took place as recorded in Scripture, don't you? Well, then, you as a weak believer don't have to despair when you have to deal with difficult trials and tests in your life because your God and King is mighty. 
Maybe you've given in to the temptations of the devil and your own sinful nature so much and so often you don't think you'll ever get out of it again. It'll ever be right with you again. And then God, but then God says to you, come here, bring that big load of your sins to Jesus Christ and stop hunting in yourself for the strength to fight the devil and the world and your sinful nature on your own. Look to me. Seek the power to change and to fight the devil and his dominion in me. I have the power, the might. My spirit has the power to bring you to love me and to love Christ more than your own desires, more than your own life even. And I want to give you that strength. I want nothing more to stand than to stand by you in the battle against the devil and the world and your own sinful nature in this life. It's not wonderful to know, congregation, his might. His is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And finally, Christ also teaches us that our Father in heaven really wants to save us from the power of the devil, really does want to. Imagine you needed money really badly and you knew somebody who had lots of money, a friend, and you go to him and ask for help, but the person turns you down. Well, then it doesn't help if that person has all the wealth and is able to do so much, but refuses to help you anyway. And it doesn't help you. Well, our Almighty Father in Christ certainly is not like that. He loves his children so much, he gave his one and only son for them. Do you think then that he would refuse to help you if you asked for his help in your trials? Would he leave you to be tempted whenever you ask for his help to overcome any trial that the devil has made into a temptation for you? Listen to how the Apostle Paul assures us of our God's help in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Same word is used there, by the way. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. You have a mighty helper, and you can be sure that he wants to help. There's nothing our Father loves to do more than to answer the cries of his weak children in Christ for help with the struggles of life when they have a hard time to keep his trials from becoming Satan's temptations. That's also why Christ added the doxology at the end of the Lord's Prayer. We confess that, that in question and answer 20, 128, it means all this we ask, all this we ask, of you because as our king having power over all things, you're both willing and able to give us all that is good. See, because of him, our father in heaven isn't only able, because of Christ, he's not only able, but he's also willing and ready to help us in our trials to fight the evil one and our own sinful nature and to grow in our faith instead through those trials, willing and ready because of everything his son did for you. In fact, because of Christ, your Father in heaven cannot refuse you when you plead for the way of escape from the temptations that in, you have to endure in his name. He cannot refuse you. And that's also then why the Lord Jesus taught us to close our prayer with that wonderful little word, Amen. If you pray all the petitions of the Lord's Prayer with a heart that seeks your life with your Father in Christ, then you may know, my Father in heaven hears me. Amen means, I believe it's true and certain. My Father in heaven hears me. He will certainly help me, save me. I don't know how, but he will hear me because I belong to Jesus Christ. Oh, it can maybe be that you don't really feel that at the moment you pray. Maybe you're dealing with pretty intense trials, 
going through quite a battle with those powerful enemies in your life who tempt you, want to make you fall into sin, into the sin you don't want to fall in, into again. But if you sincerely call upon your Father in Christ, He will be there. He will be there to draw you to Himself in and through that battle. He's there in your trial, so you end up with Christ and not with the devil and his power. He's there in that trial, and with that trial wants to draw your life away from the world in which you live and closer to Christ by his power and spirit. As long as you continually call on him. And brothers and sisters, you realize that if you don't live close to Christ and to following him, then you can only blame yourself for the temptations of the evil one that come upon you. You can't blame the Lord God. He wants nothing more for you as his child in Christ than that you win that war against those sworn enemies, the devil, the world, and your own sinful nature. He wants nothing more than that you win that battle against sin in your life more and more, the sins that you struggle with. He wants to bring you time and again to experience now already some of the victory there is in Christ. Go to your mighty Father in heaven then as your Savior teaches in the Lord's Prayer. Call him, 911, Father in heaven. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. He would love nothing more than to give you the complete victory he obtained for you, the victory which was prayed for you at your baptism already, in fact. Maybe long ago already, eh? many, many years ago. Listen to, what, to that prayer offered up after every baptism. It says there, may he or she, about the child then, may he or she live in all righteousness under our only teacher, king, and high priest, Jesus Christ, and valiantly fight against and overcome sin, the devil, and his whole dominion. And may he or she forever praise and magnify you and your son, Jesus Christ, together with the Holy Spirit, the one only true God. That was prayed for you when you were baptized and promised to you. And congregation, let's continue with that prayer in our whole life, our whole life long, until we obtain that complete victory in Christ. No sin or devil or sinful nature to fight anymore then. Only perfect peace and joy with the triune God and all his people forever. Amen.